I was given this Bible in 1989. I was registering for my first year of seminary at Nazarene Theological Seminary, and the publisher of this Bible decided that they were going to give away Bibles to all the seminary students throughout the United States. They, were, they had uh, wide margins so that it was easy for me to, to make notes, and, and I started using it, and it's been my Bible for all of those years. I've used this same Bible for so long, that, and I've actually had it rebound. I've used it so long that if you ask me where a certain story or a certain verse is, I, I will probably be able to tell you at least what column it is. On the left page, on the right column, or on the right page, the left column, down towards the bottom. It's just because I, I've, I've read it so often I've read the story so often that I, I've, it's, it's become who I am. And I, I hope that you know this morning that after I've now been your pastor for a, about a, a year and a half now, that the Word of God is extremely important to me. Therefore, it is extremely important to this church. I know you know that. I'm not going to come to you on a Sunday morning with some fuzzy liver quiver theology that I just kind of picked up from the corner somewhere and, and added a couple of points to it and called it a sermon. That's not who I am at all. And I hope you know that when you come this morning, when you come in the mornings on Sunday, that when I preach, it is based on the Word of God. Amen. Your board and I have spent some time wrestling with what is really important to us. Uh, they're called core values. Core values answers the question, why do we do what we do? Why do we do what we do? They, it, core values, it doesn't matter if it's a t-ball baseball team, a cheerleading team, a, a, a business, the Girl Scouts, all of those have core values. It tells them what's really important to what they're focused on. They tell us what we will do as a church, and the opposite is true. They also tell us what we will not do. Core values, as I describe it, they're the hills that we are willing to die for. They're so important that if they weren't part of this ministry, I don't know that I would be really interested in that ministry. That's how important these core values are to me. They define our leadership style as a church. They tell us who we will hire as pastoral staff. They tell us how we will invest our time, our energy, our money. So can I just invite you this morning to start over here, I don't know if you noticed, there are some new things on the walls. Have you noticed that yet? If not, let's go get you some glasses. <laughs> let's start over here. These are the core values that we have created for our church, and I'll be preaching for the next six weeks on these. Let's start over here, and then we'll go to the other side. Let's go. Ready? Biblical faithfulness. Read together. Dependent prayer. Authentic worship. Creative evangelism, Christ-like discipleship, loving relationships. So on the board right now is, is, a, is a paragraph that helps us to define biblical faithfulness. Do we have that slide? Let's read this together. Ready? Biblical faithfulness. We believe that spiritual transformation comes through the proclamation and relevant teaching of God's inspired word, the authoritative and trustworthy rule of faith and practice for Christians. I'm looking forward to talking to you this morning about this core value. Would you please stand and let's read together something that Paul wrote to Timothy in one of his letters, actually one of the very last things that Paul wrote before his life was taken was in 2 Timothy chapter 3, 14 through 17. My friends, what I'm about to read to you is God's inspired word. 
But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. This, my friends, is God's word. You may be seated. <coughs> I read a story about a lady who began to recognize that she was a walking contradiction related to her Christian faith. She said, on one hand, I believed that the Bible was divinely, the, uh, the Bible was divinely inspired word of God, or so I claimed. My entire knowledge of God and my salvation rested in the belief that the things found in his word were divinely inspired and true. But on the other hand, she said, I was picking and choosing the parts of the Bible that were acceptable to me, leaving the rest to be ignored. Sure, she said, there were parts of it that I loved and studied with joy and passion. There were also parts that I didn't quite understand and didn't care to understand. And then there are parts that made me completely uncomfortable, even angry. I chose to suggest there were alternative interpretations or consider them as no longer relevant or necessary to Christianity. In one moment, she said, I would acknowledge that Scripture was God-breathed, but in the next, I would be providing reasons that we could overlook or disregard certain parts of it. What could it hurt to leave out a few minor details in Scripture, she said. Can I ask you, what does it mean when I say biblical faithfulness? What does that mean to a church? What does it mean for our church? What does it mean personally for each one of us that we say, I am faithful to the Word of God. How do we live our lives in a way that is biblically faithful? Let me read it again. We believe here at Fairlawn Church of the Nazarene, the Bible is God's inspired Word and is without error the authoritative and trustworthy rule of faith and practice for Christians. Now, I know Certain words were used there, and sometimes they, weren't, they are not words that we use all the time in our normal discussions. So let me just spend some time explaining many of those words. The first thing that I need us to understand is biblical faithfulness means that we are committed to the Bible as God's inspired word. The first question we have to ask is what what is the Bible, really? What's the Bible? No other Bible or no other book is more authoritative on the topic of the Christian faith than the Bible itself. The Bible is a collection of 66 different books. It's divided into two sections, the Old and the New Covenant or the Old and the New Testament it was written by at least 40 authors that we've identified. It was written over a span of 1,500 years, and it was written in three languages. Now, as an editor, that exhausts me. Can you imagine having 40 different authors spread out over 1,500 years over multiple continents, three languages, and somehow, somehow, they all agree with each other. 
Even then, it is a unified message of God's plan and purpose for humanity. Next year, I'm going to be introducing a sermon series that I'll be preaching for 31 uh, weeks through the entire story of the Bible. And if you were put, if you were to put the entire Bible in one sentence, one storyline, it would be this. It is the story of how a loving God actively brings redemption to mankind and his kingdom on earth. It's the story of a loving God who actively brings redemption to mankind and he brings his kingdom on earth. So the big picture is that God created man in his own image and he loved his created and valued mankind. He had fellowship in the cool of the day with Adam and Eve and loved them so much that he gave them the privilege of deciding whether they would serve God or serve themselves. Unfortunately, as you know, as you've read in Genesis 3 and 4 and 5, they decided to serve themselves and they were then forced out of the presence of God because nothing unholy is ever in the presence of God. That is where sin and disease and death takes place out of the fellowship, out of the presence and fellowship of God. But God desired that mankind would come back into fellowship with him. So he created a system of redemption whereby man would have the ability to take a pure lamb, a pure animal, and the sin by faith in something that was going to happen in the future. Their sin would be placed on that lamb and death would occur. Mankind would have to take the life of that pure lamb and the priest would then take the blood and go to God on behalf of that man in faith that something was coming. That something did come in the form of the Son of God, Jesus, who was the Messiah, who was the sinless Lamb of God, who was born just like us, tempted just like us, yet without sin, the Scripture says. And he took our sin upon himself. His life was taken on a cross. He died for us, went to heaven to prepare a place for us, and it's only by faith in the work of Christ himself that we can come back into fellowship with him in the cool of the day. It was God's plan in the first place. That is the entire story of God in this Bible. 39 books make up the Old Testament, and it was written over a time span of around 900 years. We're guessing about 1500 B.C. to about 400 B.C. is when multiple authors put together all of those books. In the Old Testament, God began to, in, he begins to introduce himself to mankind. The very first verses, he says, he stands out on the platform of, the, uh, of the, the universe, and he says, Hi, I'm the creator God. And he introduces himself. He uses certain names for himself that introduces him uh, just a little bit more. And then he begins to say, I'm your provider, and I'm your redeemer, and I am the almighty God. I am the lamb of God. I am the water of life. I am the good shepherd. I am the God of peace, and on and on and on throughout the Old Testament. He's introducing himself. And in the Old Testament, he's introducing a way of redemption through the death of a pure lamb and the work of the priest who spoke to God on behalf of man. And in that same section we call the Old Testament, he begins to introduce the coming of God's kingdom on earth through the prophets. They're talking about what is about to come. That's the Old Testament. It's about two-thirds 
of the first section of the Bible. The back third, we call it the New Testament. It's made up of 27 different books and letters put together, and it was written over a span of about 50 years. They deal, these books deal with the birth of Christ, his life, his death, his resurrection, the beginning of the, the church, and then instructions on how the church and how God's people could begin to, to show the redemption of God and how this kingdom will come about on the earth. That's the New Testament. When it comes to languages, the Old Testament is written primarily in three, Hebrew and, uh, and a little bit of Aramaic in the Old Testament, and then the New Testament is written in the Greek. And yet all of these authors had their way of, of presenting a unified portrait of God's plan and purposes in our world as it was written over a span of 1,500 years. When it comes to literature, there's all sorts of literature in the Old Testament and New Testament. There's history and poetry and humor and prophecy and romance. There's letters included. There's theology, biography, songs, journals, advice, laws, stories. So the Bible is an entire library put together because there are some books that really get through to my head and others, I'm like, I don't understand that. Where somebody else would look at another book and they would really understand it and I wouldn't. The Bible was also the very first book printed on the printing press and has been the best-selling book since the 1500s. And can I also say it's the most stolen book in the world. <laughs> Anybody ever stolen a Bible out of a hotel drawer? <laughs> It's okay, if, they, if, 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 if robbers need the Bible, it was written for them. <laughs> it's been printed in 2,000 languages or so. But there was a word that I used in that statement. What does inspired mean? What does inspired mean? All scripture, the scripture says, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Can I tell you that inspired means that it is the voice of God? It is God purposely telling his children all they need to know about life and eternity. Often I attend Bible study groups and, and I hear this phrase, this is what the scripture means to me. And can I tell you that's the last thing that we need to be saying. We don't need to know what it means to you. What we do need to know is what was the original author's intent. How did God inspire them for us to understand it? Inspired also means God, God breathed. That's what inspired means. The origin of the word was God himself. It is true because it came directly from God, this word that we read. God inspired men to write his word and used their personalities and their cultures and their experiences. Some of you have, have even asked me, how can, how can John write this story and Matthew write it as well? And it's two different, they say two different things. Well, I can tell you if somebody came in here and robbed us or ran through or something, I would see that person with blue pants and, and a red shirt and somebody, one of you might say, well, he was bald and, and had tennis shoes. Well, I didn't see it that way. It, it was true. So it's two different perspectives. When God inspired writers, he used their cultures. He used their education. He used their personalities. So Paul writes different than everybody else. He's a theologian and a lawyer. 
So he writes with big words and word pictures. Peter wrote as a man passionate about church growth. And he was the one, he was the evangelist that the church spread more because of him than any other person. Paul then came behind him and was the one who built theology. Luke wrote as a medical doctor, and if you want to understand the body a little bit more, just read the crucifixion story from Luke. He explains some things that none of the other gospels includes. Mark wrote as a photojournalist. I know there wasn't cameras back then, but as you read Mark, it was like he was a reporter. He would like take a picture here and take a picture here and, a, and really short stories how he would explain who Jesus was and what he did. That is how God inspired mankind to write his words through their personality, their perspectives, and their culture. So what does it mean when I say it is without error? Those who want to reject the message of the Bible will often point to apparent errors, maybe contradictions that they see or discrepancies. Someone wrote once, looking at the Bible objectively, a book written by approximately 40 authors over a period of 1,500 years and copied over and over and over and over by hand for 1,400 years until the invention of the printing press. The accuracy and the consistency of the Bible is nothing short of astonishing. Each writer wrote with a different style, from a different perspective, to a different audience, for a different purpose. Each book was written for a certain purpose. Some were written on purpose as theology. Some were written as biography. Some were written as poetry. They must be understood. Every book needs to be understood from the intended perspective. So we'll, we should expect some minor differences, although the differences are not contradictions or not errors. They're from different perspectives. God's word is inspired and is without error. Therefore, it can be trusted. Here's something else I want us to understand. Biblical faithfulness means that our lifestyle and decisions will be built on God's word. You've probably heard uh, me talk about it, but I'm a bit of a, a book collector. I, I collect antique Bibles like pre-1900, and I like to collect antique theology uh, books. And I often will thumb through those old books very carefully just to understand the culture, uh, history, uh, what those books were focused on back in 1822. I just love to stand in the shoes of some of those pastors or laymen as they were reading back in the early 1800s to see what their books included. And sometimes I found some really nice old family Bibles that were meant, meant to be on the, the coffee table or on the, the main table of the house. And it's beautiful on the outside with leather and, and I carefully open it and the very first pages they've written down marriages and deaths and births and weights of babies and all of those sorts of things. But then whenever you look through the rest of the Bible, it's pretty obvious it's never been broken into. They used the first five pages as their history book, but they didn't use the Bible as what it was written for. Sometimes we treat our Bibles more like decorations, don't we? Some of our Bibles are only used for Sundays. The Bible... I can tell you, has every answer you will ever need. If you need an answer related to how to deal with a stubborn child, the scripture has an answer. 
You need an answer about finances? The scripture has financial advice. If you need to understand how to deal with a, a, an addiction, it's in the Bible. You need to figure out how to pray, how to become a better believer in Jesus Christ. Who is God and what can he provide for you? What can you do for God? It's in the Bible. The Bible was written to have every answer you will ever need. So all of God's word is relevant to our lives. Psalms 119, David says, How can a young man stay on the path of purity? By living according to your word. I seek your word with all of my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Praise be to you, Lord. Teach me your decrees. With my lips I recount all the laws that come from your mouth. I rejoice in following your statutes as one rejoices in, rich, in great riches. I meditate on your precepts and consider your ways. I delight in your decrees. I will not neglect your word. God's word is sufficient to bring us to salvation. I just read the scripture in 2 Timothy. The scriptures are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Back whenever I was uh, working for the Chick Shaver Center for Evangelism, I received a call from an older lady in our Sunday school class, and she said, Brent, uh, I, she said, I work as the secretary to the Christian radio station in Belton, Missouri. And she said, I, I just received, um, uh, it was KLJC, you might remember it used to be the, the only Christian station in Kansas City. And she said, I just received a call by a, a, a Jewish man who uh, has some spiritual questions. Is there any way that you or Dr. Shaver could help? And I talked to my boss, Dr. Shaver, who was an evangelist, and he said, would you mind connecting with him? And I said, I'm, I would be glad to. So I met David Karp, K-A-R-P, at a, uh, a restaurant for coffee. And he tells me his story. <clears throat> he said, Brent, uh, I'm a, a practicing Jew. My, my father was, um, is Jewish, and he never would allow us to read anything beyond the first five books of the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, because it was the law. And he said, but I wanted to know what the rest of the Old Testament talked about. So he said, I, I begin to read the rest of the Old Testament. And he said, I remember a day when I realized I was now through the Old Testament and I'd heard that there were some other books. And he said, I decided quietly without my father knowing, and he was, he's two years older than me. He said, I decided I had to know. And so I read Matthew, and Mark, and Luke, and John. And he said, after I read John, he said, I was standing in the driveway of my house. And after I read John, he said, I began to believe that Jesus was my Messiah. Can I tell you why John is written? John was written, quote, so that they might believe. And David Carp, to this very day, if you ask him how he's doing, he says, oh, one day closer to paradise. That was 30 years ago that he accepted Jesus Christ as a personal Savior by reading the Word of God. The Word of God tells us how to live how to pray, how to deal with conflict, how to love our spouse, raise our kids, respect our government, pray for our leaders, make healthy decisions, be good stewards of nature. It tells us how we will become an effective church, how to love the unlovable, how to be compassionate with each other, how to minister to our community how to handle 
God's word, how to be godly leaders, what God expects of us related to giving God our first and our best tithes and offering. The word of God has everything that we need as church leaders to tell us how to be an effective church of God. The biblical faithfulness also means that we are committed to allowing the Bible to transform us. It has the power to convict us. Paul tells Timothy, he uses the word rebuke. It's powerful to rebuke. Have you ever heard God's word read and you have felt the Holy Spirit pierce your heart? I have. That's the rebu rebuke of the Holy Spirit that God uses through the Bible. As we read God's word, he begins to talk to us. The Holy Spirit begins to minister to us, move in our hearts, right? That's the conviction of the Holy Spirit rebuking us. It also has the power to restore us or correct us, heal us, soothe us, peace together, bring unification. I told you the time that I was uh, under, uh, about a year ago, I was telling you that I was going through a pretty difficult season in my life. And I just felt like God told me, begin to read Psalms and don't stop. I had some time, so I began to read Psalms. And, and I knew I wasn't able to stop, so I read all 150 chapters. And then I felt like God said, do it again the next day. And I did. And the next day do it again. And it was through the reading of God's word that he began to restore me. He began to put things back in place. He began to put my, my understanding of what he was trying to do in my life in perspective. God's word has the power to restore us. It also has the power to change us. John 17, 17 says, Jesus prays, sanctify them by your word. In other words, change them. He was praying, mold them, Lord. He was praying, remake them by your scriptures. Years ago, the state of Kentucky had a law that every classroom in its public schools had to post the Ten Commandments. The Supreme Court ruled against the state of Kentucky ordering it to take down all of the copies of the Ten Commandments from the walls of its school, of the, of the schools, and they said this, having the commandments on the wall may induce a student to read, meditate upon, and actually obey what is therein written. Now, most of us, that during that day and even today, do not like the decision that they made. But can I tell you, there's a huge silver lining around that statement. In other words, the Supreme Court of the United States of America recognized that the Word of God had the ability to transform the character of the people who read it. Friends, the Word of God has the power to transform you. It has the power to begin a redemptive process in your life. It has the ability to bring brokenness to addictions, forgiveness for sin, redeeming of a life, it's in the Word of God. And I would encourage you, if you think that you are at a dead end, if you think your marriage is on the rocks, if you think that sin cannot be forgiven, can I encourage you to go to God's Word? And like, like I said at the prayer time, God promises that if we pray the will of God, he will always hear and he will always answer. The big question is, how do I pray the will of God? Sometimes I'm not praying the will of God. And God has to teach me. 
move me, adjust me finally to the place where I understand God's word and I'm praying his will. And the way that we understand God's will better than any other way is reading his word and praying the scriptures. If you don't know how to pray the scriptures, come talk to me. Let's talk about it. I've got some tools, I've got some prayer cards that I would love to show you so that we could begin to learn how to pray his word. The other thing that means is it is active, the word of God is active in our life. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 says, for, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the uh, dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. One scholar observed the student doesn't so much study the Bible as the Bible itself studies the student. That is, the Bible is, living, uh, is a living thing, serving as a tool of the Holy Spirit. Have you ever thought of that, thought of it that way? That the Word of God is used as a tool of the Holy Spirit to teach us, to mold us, to unify us, to convict us. David commented that he had hidden God's word in his heart so that he might not sin against God. Psalm 119 is the longest chapter in the entire Bible and every single verse talks about his word. Test me on this. Read Psalm 119 this, this afternoon right after your Nazarene nap. And just see that I'm not correct. Every verse talks about God's word in some way. James wrote that if a man doesn't look at God's law, but actually does it, he will be blessed. You can't just read God's word. You have to do God's word. Biblical faithfulness also means we are committed to the Bible to prepare us for his use. The Word of God is useful for training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Paul uses two words that are important. He says training and equipped. Training has much more of a, uh, of a meaning related to discipline. The vineyard owners that I was around in Washington, those who had grape vineyards as well as apple orchards, they understood what it meant to train the vine. They wanted those vines and the branches out towards the warmer air, up into the sky so that the sun could get to them. The, the apple orchard um, guys knew that the apple tree needed to have a center area right down in the middle that didn't have any limbs so that the sun and the warm air could come down into the middle of the tree. So they understood what it meant to train a tree or train a grapevine. That's what God is talking about here. The vine is cared for. And sometimes it's stressed so that it could bear the best fruit. The Word of God has the same responsibility. It disciplines us to ensure that we are producing the most and the best and the long-standing fruit. That's what Paul was talking about. But equipped means something a little bit different. It speaks more of ensuring that we have been prepared for the task ahead. Lessons and wisdom and resources and illustrations are given to us through the word so that God can prepare us so that we can be more effective servants of his. The word of God is extremely important to a young child, a young teenager who is being developed, isn't it? Notice how this passage was introduced. But as for you, continue in what we have learned and have become convinced of because you know those from whom you learned it and you know from infancy 
you have known the Holy Scriptures. The New Testament scholar William Barclay said this, he said, it was the glory of the Jews that their children from the earliest days were trained even from their swaddling clothes and drank it with their mother's milk. They claimed that the law was so imprinted on the heart and mind of a Jewish child that he would sooner forget his own name than forget the word of God. From infancy, the Bible has been my primary standard of truth. My parents taught me the word of God. My Sunday school teacher, Jerry, taught me the word of God by his life. My youth pastor, Terry, taught me God's word. My Bible professors in college, Dr. McCarthy and Dr. McCain, taught me God's word. And when I do baby dedications, I give the baby a, a Bible and encourage that baby as if he or she understands me to chew on it if he wants. It's his. It's hers. I want them to recognize this word of God is to be with them constantly. It's their salvation. It's their truth. I've never had a baby die of chewing on a Bible, so it's okay. We must teach our children and young people the importance of God's word. Adults, we can learn from the children's commitments. Adults, if you are not studying God's word regularly, if you are not studying God's word regularly, I can show you that you're easily tempted. I can show you that often you are spiritually weak and can be swayed by false winds. Adults, you must get involved in Bible study yourself. Get involved in, a, in a, a small group that gets together weekly to wrestle with the Word of God, to find out His truth for your life. Go to a Sunday school class. Go to a Bible study group. If you want to start one, please see me or Pastor Tom. We'll, we'll start one so that you can be involved. But it's so important to study the Word of God yourself. And the last truth is this. Biblical faithfulness means the Bible is our final standard of truth. Jesus clearly taught that the Bible is, is ultimate and is the only standard of truth for what is right and what is wrong. Jesus said that we are to live by every word that comes from the mouth of God and we should not live by any other words. In John 17, 17, Jesus prayed, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is the truth. Jesus didn't say your word is true. That would mean that the Bible is measured against something else making it true to the standard. Instead, he used a very specific Greek noun of for truth to say that God's word is truth itself. The Bible doesn't need to conform itself to some higher standard of truth, but rather is the truth itself. The very expression of the nature, the, the character and will of God because it is the very words of God himself right here in the scripture. What the Bible says, God says, it's that simple. So the Bible is the measuring stick by which every other claim to truthfulness is to be measured. Measure who you're going to vote for by reading God's word. We have an election coming up in about a month. Go to your word to find out if who you are going to vote for follows God's word. Make your financial decisions by this standard. It's found right here. Decide on moral issues like abortion 
by this word. Nobody else. Choose your future spouse by reading this word. Choose how to deal with addictions by this word. Choose how you respond in a holy way right here. This is the word. Teachings that conform to scripture are true. Those that do not conform to the scripture are false. Truth is what God says, not what men think. Can I say that again? Truth is what God says, not what men think. This is the word of the Lord. Would you please stand? If you're wondering this morning what church to attend, if you're wondering what kind of truth your children will be taught, if you're wondering how effective your tithes and your offerings are, if you're wondering what we think of the place of the Bible, if you're wondering what will be preached from this pulpit every single Sunday? The answer is simply this. It's no wonder that our first core value is biblical faithfulness. We believe the Bible is God's inspired word and is without error. It's the authoritative and trustworthy rule of faith and practice for all Christians. This is why we do what we do.
receive this benediction. David prays a prayer in Psalm 119 about his love for God's word. Receive his benediction today. May you rejoice in following his statutes as one rejoices in great riches. May you meditate on his precepts and consider his ways. May you delight in his decrees and not neglect his word. So now, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, go in peace, for he's already gone before you. You're dismissed, my friends.